sin where is your sting and death where is your victory grave where is your power you got no claim on me you got no claim on me oh, oh, oh. to your feet this morning. We welcome you here to this Easter Sunday at Bethany First Church. We're so glad that you're here. Hey, if you're new this morning, we want to get to know you a little bit better. There's a card underneath your armrest today. If you could fill that out and turn it in, we'd love to get to know you better. This is the day that our Lord has risen from the dead. He is alive. And scripture tells it this way. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, for he has risen from the grave. And we celebrate that today. Amen? Come on, church. Let's celebrate that he is risen. Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today.
redeeming work is done. Come on, let's sing it. Love's redeeming work is done. celebrate today. We believe that Christ is the victor. Amen. And every victory belongs to him. He's the original victor. And we look to him and point to him for the reason for all of the victories in our life today. Come on. So let's declare it this morning. Every victory is yours. Let's sing it. Every victory is yours.
Feel free to have a seat. It was early on Easter morning that women went to the tomb to prepare body, Jesus' body for burial. And there they encountered an angel who said to them, you're looking for Jesus Christ of Nazareth, right? The one who was crucified? Well, he is not here. He is risen. <laughs> Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, and we celebrate this morning. I love the fact that God knows you. You may feel like you're in a crowded room this morning, but, but God knows who you are. He knows, he knows which seat you're sitting in. He sees you. He knows what's in your heart, and He loves you more than I could ever explain. And this morning, He's put a message in my heart. What, what, what if God has something to say to you today? I, I've got a feeling most people here would say, well, if the God who created everything has something to say to me today, I'm, I probably need to hear it, right? I want to hear it. And so let me just pray, God, would you, would you speak to us? It, it, it overwhelms me, Lord, when I sit in one of these seats and I realize that of all the people here that you see me and that you know me and that you love me and, and that there's often things that you want to say to me. I love it when you speak to me. And so, Lord, I pray that you will speak today in a powerful way. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
stand and sing this with us? Wonderful singing today. You may be seated.
You know, it was several years ago that Annette and I got up one morning and I didn't come directly to the office like I normally do. And the reason is, is because I had a funeral at 10 and I was trying to work and make sure I had my message just right. And so I stayed home in my home office and going over the funeral. Uh, I ran in maybe a little later than I should have, got a shower. Uh, Annette was getting ready. I actually got completely dressed, had my suit on And looked in the mirror and noticed that I had an eyebrow that was kind of out of control. It happens as you get older, you know. And uh, and so I've got this nifty little uh, trimmer. Just pop the guard on it. You just take one swath across against the grain, and it mows it down beautifully. Um, Problem was, I didn't put the guard on. As soon as I go across one time, I look in the mirror and I said. Oh, my goodness. And I looked at Annette, and she said, what? And she looked at me. You, you would think that with my hair color, it wouldn't be that noticeable. It's noticeable. So, you know, we've got minutes to get out the door, and, and I just felt like you got to make a decision. And I said, I'm shaving the other one. <laughs> and Annette intervened. She wouldn't let me do it. And she decided she would try instead to draw one on with an eyebrow pencil. So, so she did, and, and she kind of just got it a little large, and, and one side of my face looked really excited, and the other looked just very confused. It was this kind of look right here. It was just, what's going on with your face, Rick, you know? And so I said, hey, let me wash it off, and, and I'll try just doing dots. And so I did. I washed it off, and I just got up in the mirror with this pencil, and I'm just doing these little dots. And it was in that moment that I looked over and my wife was up in the mirror doing the same thing. I'd never experienced that before in my life, never. And so finally, uh, the, the dots looked better, not great, but better. And so I came and, and I did the service. It was for a special lady named Judy, who was one of our pastors to families with babies. She took care of our nursery. It was a, it was a wonderful celebration of her life. And, and from up here, it works out, but when I would be in a one-on-one conversation, you would see people's eyes just drift up to my eyebrow, you know? And I didn't know anything to do but just to confess and say, yep, I shaved that one off this morning. <laughs> if you're wondering, it's two weeks. It takes two weeks to grow back an eyebrow. Yeah, two weeks, yeah. You say, Rick, what are you doing all anxious and nervous and come in and and, 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 and not be thinking about putting the guard on the tremor. Well, I, I typically am before I preach. Whether it's a funeral or whether it's a regular Sunday morning or whether it's something like Easter today. Because there's so much at stake, you know? There's so much that's hanging in the balances. And, and I desperately want God to speak through me. I don't want to just come and, and people say, did you go to church today? And they say, yeah, and... You know, there was some music, and then Rick did his thing for about 30 minutes, and then we left. No. I want want God to speak to us. I want revelation to happen. I want God to make himself known. And unfortunately, he uses people like me to do it. So I've been waiting for weeks to stand right here today three times in our three services and say this to you. Jesus finds people where they are and he raises them to a life they never dreamed they could live. (laughs) It's Resurrection Sunday, folks, okay? You're going to have to get with me. Jesus finds people right where they are, right? And he raises them to a life they never dreamed possible to live. I see it over and over again in the New Testament, story after story. You remember this guy who was blind, and Jesus makes some mud, and he puts it on his eyes. And he says to him, now I want you to go and wash. And so the guy goes and washes, and he can see. He was born blind, but now he can see. And people started saying, tell us the story. What happened? What do you think about Jesus? And finally, he just says, here's what I know. I used to be blind, but now I see. Jesus found me where I was. And he has raised me to now live a life that I didn't ever think I would get to live as a seeing man. 
It's the same with the guy who was crippled for 38 years. And Jesus said, do you want to get well? Then take up your mat and walk. And a man who had not walked for 38 years stood up and started walking. And people started saying, tell us your story. What happened? You used to not be able to walk. And he said, the man called Jesus, told me to pick up my mat and walk. His story was, Jesus found me where I was. And he raised me to a life I didn't even dream was possible to live. It's the same with the lady who was caught in adultery. They stood her before Jesus. Said, Jesus, the law of Moses says we can stone her. What do you think? And Jesus says, go ahead, but do it this way. The one among you without any sin... You throw the first stone. And they all began to drop their stones and they walked away. And Jesus says to her, Who condemns you? And she said, No one. And he said, Then neither do I condemn you. Go leave your life of sin. And here's her story Jesus found me where I was and he raised me to a life that I never dreamed I would get to live. Isn't it great? Is that your story? It is. Is there anybody in the room saying, it's not my story yet? But I pray to God that before I die, that that will be my story. That Jesus will raise me to that kind of life. So I'm not a three-point preacher. I'm sorry if you wanted a three-point sermon. I don't have three. I just got one. But at least I've got one, right? So you can't leave saying, that sermon was pointless. <laughs> I appreciate you laughing at that. I was afraid you wouldn't. <laughs> and so here's the point. You can say it with me by now. Jesus finds people where they are and raises them to a life they never thought they could live. Amen. Well, there's a guy whose name is Paul. And he writes a letter to some people in a city called Ephesus. And I want to talk to you about his words to them this morning. You, you remember over the last six weeks, we've talked about the suffering of Jesus. Just two days ago on Friday, starting at noon, people started coming into this room, this sanctuary. And, and they began to stream through all day until 8 o'clock at night. Hundreds and hundreds of people just came through the room. And, and we focused on the suffering of Jesus and the sacrifice that Jesus made. It ended right here with the cross. It's where Jesus died for us. On Saturday, there was silence. Nothing happened. But then on Sunday morning, these ladies go to the tomb to prepare Jesus' body better for burial. And they encounter an angel who says, why in the world are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here, gals. He's risen. (laughs) And then Paul, years later, writes to these people in Ephesus and says, If Jesus was raised from the dead, guess what? We get to be raised too. Planted a church, spent two years. Ten years later, he writes them from prison. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, here's what he says. Okay? As for you, you were dead. I mean, it sounds like somebody's needing a resurrection, right? Somebody is dead. As for you, you were dead. Not, not physically, but you were dead in your transgressions and in your sins. In what you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. Anybody know what it is to follow the ways of this world? And the ruler of the kingdom of the air. He's talking about the evil one here, the devil. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. He says, not only you Gentiles who have become Christians, but also as Jews, all of us lived among them at one time. We gratified the cravings of the flesh, following its desires and thoughts. He says, when I think about us, I think we were by nature deserving God's wrath. But God didn't give us his wrath, did he? But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, he made us alive. (laughs) He found us where we were, 
And he raises us to a life we never thought we could live. He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace. It's a gift that we've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages, like 2,000 years later, so a group of people in Oklahoma who gathered together one Easter Sunday morning would hear the story, okay, that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I remember reading a story a while back. It was about a lady whose name was Nora. Nora grew up in a tough family. And it wasn't too long until Nora found herself on her own as a young girl. Someone introduced her to drugs. She became a drug addict. And Nora said, I began to live my life willing to do anything that I needed to do to, to gain drugs. Years went on. Nora believed that her life wasn't going to last long. And one day, she found herself standing in front of a little Nazarene church in Hialeah, Florida, near Miami. And she goes up to see if there's anybody around, knocking on doors, windows, walks around to the back, and she sees a few ladies there in a fellowship hall. They were busy doing something. She said, I was skin and bones. I asked them if there was anything they could do to help me a little something to eat, something. I just needed some help. And they said, we can help you, Nora. They sat down with her. They gave her something to eat. They promised to help her more. And one of the ladies said, Nora, would you like to know Jesus? Would you like for Jesus to help you? Would, would, would you like to, to give your heart to Jesus? Would you like for Jesus to be with you, to walk with you through your life? And Nora said, I mean, if somebody's willing to help me, you know, I don't know much about Jesus, but I know a little about Jesus, but sure, if, I mean, I'm going to die out here. I mean, yeah, if there's help, I'll, I'll take whatever help I can get. I'll, I'll take some Jesus. She said, I meant it. I needed help. And she said, they began to pray with me. And, and I began to repeat this prayer with them, asking Jesus to come into my heart, asking Jesus to walk with me, asking Jesus to forgive me of my sins. And she said, something started happening inside of me. It, it's, like, it's like the whole world changed. I, I remember walking out of that little church, and I remember looking up the sky, and it just looked different. All of life was different. Something happened. Those ladies stayed with me. They kept working with me and loving on me. Finally, I get a job. I get a place to live. My life begins to change. I get off the drugs. And I begin to say to the pastor of the church, Pastor Mel, there's a lot of people like me. We need to help those people. I didn't feel like he was real, you know, receptive to my ideas, but I began to bring them to church. I didn't know how the church felt about me bringing those people. The pastor's wife died. And after months, he began to pray for a new wife. God, you know I need a wife. I can't do this job without a partner, somebody to help me. Give me a wife. I'm lonely. I'm depressed. And he said, one day when I was praying, I felt like God said, you're to marry Nora. To which he responded, I don't want to marry Nora. <laughs> I know who Nora has been. I know what Nora has done. I don't want to marry Nora. And he said, I heard some words of Scripture that I've preached from many times. Don't call anything unclean that I have made clean. And my heart began to open, he said. And I married Nora. And then there was no way around it. We started going down and feeding people in downtown Miami who were homeless and before long, I began to believe that God wanted me to bring them out to our church, and we would bring busloads. We would feed them breakfast. We would feed them lunch before we would take them back downtown until one day two men said, we don't want to go back downtown. We want to stay here. 
And he said, I stood up one Sunday morning, Mel did, and I asked, is there anybody in the room that has an apartment or a house these men could live in? And a man raised his hand. And that was the beginning of the Home of the Nazarene, a transitional housing program to bring people off the street into permanent housing. I brought their picture because I thought you'd want to see it. Can you imagine Nora, a pastor's wife? Isn't it amazing what God does? He finds people right where they are, and he raises them to a life they never dreamed they could live. Do you think Nora, who was skin and bones, who stumbles into the fellowship hall of a church, dreamed that one day she would be a pastor's wife of that very church? But God finds people right where they are, and he raises them to a life they never imagined they could live. You're all kind of quiet. Here's the thing. When I talk about God finding us where we are, where we are is not always where we want to be. Nora wasn't where she wanted to be. That's her story. Do you understand it's also my story? When I was 19 years old, I was not where I wanted to be. I was raised in this awesome Christian home. My parents lived out their faith. But in my last years of high school, I began to wonder. I got off track terribly. I remember one Saturday night, probably early Sunday morning, I'm trying to navigate those country roads and get myself home. And I remember praying, God, please don't let me die like I am. I can't die like this. I'm not ready. And you might say, Rick, you were just being a boy. You were just being a young man. You were, just, you were just doing what young men do. I wasn't being who I wanted to be. I wasn't living the life I wanted to live. And I remember the Sunday night that I walked down an aisle and I found myself kneeling at an altar and I asked Jesus if he would raise me to that life too. It was like I was born all over again. I was changed. I was different. It's, it's the same story of the people that Paul writes to in Ephesus. He says, you remember what your life was like? You were physically alive, but spiritually, you were dead. And it was because of your sin. Now, it's a word that we got to deal with. And so I just decided if I'm going to say the S word, I'll just put it on the screen and we'll define it, okay? So here's a good definition for sin. Written by a guy whose name was John Wesley, great theologian. He said, a sin is a willful transgression against the known will of God. You with me? It's willfully turning away from what I know God wants. I know what God wants. I know that God has an opinion about it, but I'm not going to do what God wants. It's a willful transgression against the known will will of God. So he gets specific. And he says, they're not following God back in those days. Here's what you were following. You were following the ways of the world. You were following the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the devil. You were following your own cravings and desires of your flesh. He says, it's like a bad list. Throw a blanket over that, would you? I don't like that. But can we not relate? Is there anybody in the room who would say, Rick, I've never kind of been carried along by culture and been more influenced by culture than I was by God's word? Is there anybody that can say, no. There's been times that I feel like I've just kind of been carried away with culture and I've been way more influenced by culture than I was God's word. I mean, who can't say that the devil tempted me and I gave in? And who else cannot say, there were times in my life when there was something I wanted to do or to say, and I knew it was wrong, but it's what I wanted, and I said it or I did it anyway. And Paul is very quick to say that when we follow the ways of the world, and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And when we follow our own cravings and desires, 
it does not lead to life. It leads to a sad place. Yeah. I read a story um, recently of two guys who went to an art museum, and they stopped in front of a painting that really had the attention of one because he was a, he was a great chess player. And the title of the painting was Checkmate. And, uh, and so on the painting, uh, there was this picture of the devil playing chess with this other guy, and the image reveals that, that the devil has put the man in checkmate. I brought a picture of the painting so you could see it if you wanted to. So you, you, you get the image here, right? Um, I've got you right where I want you. Checkmate. It's over. The game's finished. The enemy has won. And so what, what one of the guys who was the, you know, notable chess player, he says, uh, you, you go on. I got to stay a minute. I, I want to look at this longer. And so his friend goes on and, and he looks at the painting and he studies it and he finally begins to realize, wait a minute, it's not checkmate. The king has another move. The, the king has another move. It's not checkmate. He goes and he, and he gets his friend and he says, come back. He says, I got to show you. And he says, see, it's not checkmate. The painter is wrong. The king actually has another move. It's, the game's not over. The, the king has another move. They, they tortured Jesus. They hit him with their fists. They beat him with a rod and a staff. They they hung him on a cross after they whipped him and he died on that cross. They put him in a tomb and they sealed it. And the enemy said, it's over. It's done. We're finished with Jesus. But King Jesus had another move. The enemy didn't count on the resurrection. See, the enemy said, he's in the tomb, he's buried, it's over. But on the third day, Jesus arose. Jesus had one more move. You, you may be sitting here today saying that you feel like the enemy has an upper hand on you right now. It may be that you feel like the enemy is winning. He's beating you. You may feel trapped. You may feel that you don't have any hope. Let me tell you something this morning. King Jesus has another move for your life. It's not over. He's still writing your story. Your marriage may be struggling. You may be worried sick about one of your kids or somebody that you love. I don't care how bad your situation is. Jesus has another move for you. It's about resurrection. And so when you think about these people in Ephesus... And you think about them saying, it's like, yeah, we're, we're, we're alive, but we're not spiritually alive. You know, what's the answer? The answer is the resurrection, because he understands from chapter one that when we become believers, we are in Christ, and if he is raised, we are also raised with him, and even though we are dead in our sins, we can be raised to new life in Jesus, because Jesus finds people right where they are. And he raises them to a life they never dreamed possible that they could live. I love this. He says, you know how you get saved, right? It's, it's by faith. It's, it's, it's by grace through faith. This is a gift from God. You don't, you don't live your life saying, if I can just get better, if I can just live better, if I can do better, if I can try hard enough, if I can do that long enough, then maybe one day I'll be good enough for Jesus to accept me. Oh, that's not the gospel. <laughs> that's not even a good story. Here's the gospel. You come to Jesus as you are, and you are saved by grace. It's a gift. Yeah. You want to stand with me? This morning... There, there, there are people here who would say, Rick, I'm telling you, buddy, Jesus found me and he raised me to a new life. That's my story. And I'm so happy for you. And there's some of you who are saying, that's not my story yet, but I want it to be. And, and I don't want to leave this world until that becomes my story. 
And, and there's others of you who are saying, I feel like the enemy, you know, has the upper hand in our lives right now. It, it, it feels hopeless. We feel trapped right now. We got a situation we're going through. Let me tell you, God has another move for you. He has not finished writing your story. And so this morning, we're going to celebrate God's faithfulness together. But before we do, I want us to pray. And when I say us, I mean all of us. And so would you bow your heads with me? If your story is that God has raised you to new life, will you begin now by giving him thanks? Just thank you, Jesus. Say thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. If it's not your story yet, and you want to know Jesus' saving, forgiving grace, just ask for it. Oh, I know I've sinned. I'm sorry. I want this new life Rick's talking about. Would you raise me to that new life? Faith for Paul is about solidarity and union with Christ. Jesus, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to live for you. I surrender my life to you in this moment. Please forgive me. Raise me to this new life. And it could be this morning that you just feel like there's not hope. The enemy has the upper hand. He thinks he's one in your life. And you've got to look him in the face and say, no, Jesus has another move for my family, for my situation. And as you pray, Jesus hears you pray right now. Also, there's going to be pastors on either side of the church this morning, over here to my far left and over here to my far right. And if you want to come and talk with and pray with the pastor this morning, just step out from where you are, please. They are waiting here to talk to you. Thanks for hearing us pray, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh
You're strong and I've witnessed it. You're constant, I've witnessed it. And I'm confident I'll see it again and again. You love and I've witnessed it. You heal and I've witnessed it. You save and I've witnessed it. And I'm confident I'll see it again and again. You're good and I've witnessed it. You're strong and I've witnessed it. You're constant, I've witnessed it. And I'm confident I'll see it again and again. You love and I've witnessed it. You heal and I've witnessed it. You save and I've witnessed it. And I'm confident. much for worshiping with us today. Um, if it's one of your first Sundays, please, we would love for you to fill out the card just under your armrest. If you take it to the uh, greeters in the foyer, they have a gift for you. I'll just tell you, you're going to want that gift. I'm hoping there's some of that gift left over because I would love some of that gift. Um, and then uh, go from there to the atrium. We have iced coffee, hot coffee, donuts, cookies, love to get together photo booths for your family to take a picture together as a family let me say one final thing to you um i want you to come back sunday you're welcome here there's a place for you here i want to be your pastor and and i'm just saying to you from the depths of my heart please come and worship with us again we would love to have you come back okay god bless you happy easter everybody